Gig Gab, episode 404 for Monday, November 20th, 2023. Greetings, folks. And welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Napomo, California, Paul Kent. How are you today, man? Doing good, Dave. How you doing? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. I, uh, cool. Yeah, we had, um, I've played a lot of music with a lot of different people since we've spoken last. Uh, I had a Monkey Fist rehearsal for a gig coming up the Saturday after Thanksgiving here. And that, that went well. It was... um. Monkey Fist doesn't usually rehearse, <laughs> um, but we wanted to, we have a guitar player that's been playing with us for about a year and we just kind of wanted to get some more reps in for, for him and for the rest of us. We haven't played together in, I don't know, six or eight weeks. And so we just got together and played through a bunch of stuff, some stuff that we've gone through before and uh, added some new songs to the set, which is always a nice thing because the Monkey Fist set list has a way of staying exactly the same or song list. I should say it changes every gig, yeah. but you know, the song list has stagnated for, you know, a decade at times. So, um, so that was good. And then, um, I got together with fling on Saturday, which was the first time kind of running through some songs since Mike left. And that, that was, that was, it was good. We changed some things up and kind of thinking about things differently. So it'll be, I'm, I'm curious and, optimistically eager to see how fling evolves over the next year. So, yeah, I mean, things evolve, right? I, I mean, I mean, there's very few groups that have had long runs that haven't. One of the characteristics of them having a long run is their ability to navigate change. Rarely, rarely does the whole personnel stay the same. Yes. And really the, you know, what you, what you do and how you emote your music doesn't change, you know, that's a bad thing. So, so, you know, if you want to have a long run, if you have something worth keeping together with the critical mass of, of people, yep, you got to change. Yeah. You just, you adapt and it works out fine. Usually, uh, you know, it, it's, um, I, I obviously, I mean, like we all have, I've, I've been in bands that have changed, uh, before this one and fling has been one of those bands that has changed over the years. And, as long, like you said, as long as you have critical mass of the right people and uh, an, uh, not just a willingness, but an eagerness to explore what the new dynamic is, right? Y you know, if there's a resistance to it, that can often be the thing that just, you know, kills a band. If it's like, ah, oh, it sucks. We got to deal with it without this person or whatever. Then, then it's, you know, but it's like, all right, I'm curious. Let's see what happens. And, you know, kind of. Moving with momentum. Curious is good. What's that? Yeah. So yeah, curious. curious is good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, l l let me let me push in table stakes for this conversation. So uh, the house rockers are going to be looking for a new drummer, or are looking for a new drummer. Mm. So, so a lineup that was largely stable for a real long time had a drummer retire about six years ago. Right. Yep. That was and, that was Joe. Uh, right. Yeah, actually, probably longer than six years ago, and uh, you know, and but he was in he was in the chair for about fifteen years. I yeah. mean, we were we were rock stable, right? So then we move up, and then we found and we're lucky that another great band in the area was retiring after forty nine years, uh, and we grabbed their drummer, and we had a really good run for a couple of years. But then that drummer decided he didn't want to he didn't want to be pinned to one project and. Uh, uh, you know, he was, ha and he has sub for us and, you know, th does a great job, but he's, he, he's not in the band anymore. So when, when he decided that, then we had another drummer and we ran with that drummer for two years who just decided at the end. And again, I, I get, I get, I'm a band guy. Like I want, I want a brotherhood. Right. right. Yep. And, and S in, same. under the, yeah, I, yeah. I, I mean, as much as like. I would be, I, I like the, the brotherhood that exists with Uptown Celebration, but 
I also think that band would be a great one for the Van Band formula with modular players. <laughs> yeah. However, I, I, you know, I, I like, I'm like you, I, I like the brotherhood for sure. Yeah. Well, and, and the funny thing is, is, is right now I'm kind of staring at the house truckers and trying to figure out who we're going to be next. Right. So, mm-hmm. so it, it just has changed. I mean, we had a good long run where it was a very tight group of guys building something together. Then it became, you know, quite established and the new people who have come in, you know, didn't share that sense of, destiny and history and you know and that you know i chose and so you know knowing that that's kind of where we went yep and i like having a band where we have a deep catalog i could pull out any song at any time you know and you know react to the crowd in different ways and you know that that's very different than the van band formula right they they can you know pop something up on a on on a teleprompter and certainly they, they have a deep catalog and that's a fine model but that's not my model, right? That's my not the, model that's not the brotherhood model. No, that's, that's, it, you, he may pull a song that everybody on stage knows, but has never played with that particular lineup. Right. Like, so, and also part of the joy is going deep into something, you know, even a little bit of goof in there is not the worst thing. When someone asks for a deep cut that they heard us play, you know, 15 years ago, that's part of the live experience right that's, especially it's, it's if very real and in the moment especially if you make sure the crowd knows it too right like yeah. you, you know oh this guy requested something man it's been 10 years since we played it what do you think guys and then you know, off yep. you go right you know exactly then, yep so you know our band um and then in addition to that you know another angle when i moved out of town and cut the amount of gigs that the house rockers are doing musicians in my group did as musicians will filled the time with some other things generally their own projects right yep so so that time is now you know filled and i don't know that we've really coming out of covid where we've really i mean coming out of covid people were so so hungry for music they were excited to see us play again it was nice that the grand sum of the time that we've spent building this brand and this band had meant something to people um and we have done a good job, a workmanlike job of continuing to nurture that kind of relationship with, with people. And again, in our area, there's tons of those outdoor festivals and outdoor concert series where we get to play to a lot of people, you know, several times during summer. And it's a, kind of a big event when we come in. We've built our ticketed business. That's a new thing, you know, since COVID. That's kind of cool. Um, but it's a different band now. And, you know, I came away from that van band thinking like, you know, opportunity, and again, let me say just the way that I booked the band is about now, actually in late October, I, I marked the calendar and I said, these are the weekends that I'm going to be booking the band. I've got quite a history. Guys, don't book anything out. You know, give me until whatever date I gave them and hold those weeks for me. You book yeah. the other weeks, you know, right? But stuff comes up in between that are good opportunities or good paying opportunities for the guys who really rely on the money or good exposure opportunities, meaning we'll play to a lot of people, you know, that could be a strategic thing to get us in place for other types of things or it might just be fun to do. And so the, what to do with those things that come up in between times now has me wondering, do I need to kind of like roll up my sleeves and get two or three people deep in, in, in everything? And then again, what is the band now? So I don't, I, this is not, this is not a, a, an expression of ego. No, it's just the, talking out loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but but Nick and I are kind of the constants. To a great degree, Simon. Simon yep. missed his first gig last year, um, and we got through it just fine. Our bass player, Chris, is is you know this is a you know our first priority, and I I don't know whether he would cancel other things. I, I I don't I don't you know we haven't we haven't had that situation yet where something good has come up for this band that everybody has to make a decision. It wasn't on the originally scheduled list of hold weekends. Right. You know, it used to be once upon a time, this was absolutely first call for everyone. And that's probably a discussion I might have to have moving forward saying, where's your guys' heads on this? Yeah. You know, can I count on you if something comes up in between our scheduled, you know, times? And, uh, and I might have to go deep and change it. And I really am not emotionally... And I think that's the right word. I'm not emotionally prepared to change my business model like that. I, I, I can see that. that I mean, yeah, and that's a fair I thing mean, to say, right? Like, I mean, it, like, it's fair to say because it's true, right? So therefore, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, basically, my horns are are largely, you know, calling this first call. Yep. You know, Nick has a Zappa thing now, and he's very great about communicating and calendaring when he plans to not be around. Uh, and again, I am pretty good at pushing the stuff I know I'm going to get repeat business from into the weekends that I have it scheduled. And then, you know, so we're talking about one weekend a month, January, February, March, maybe April, two weekends a month, May, June, July, August, September. Right. That's cool. Yeah. And then, and then like just leaving November and December for any kind of private work or corporate work or anything special thing that might come up that that's kind of, that's kind of the model that we have right now. And it kind of works. I think it works until something comes up. That's a really good opportunity that it's frustrating to say no to. Right. I, we're, we're dealing with that with uptown right now. It, it, we, you know, not only was there COVID in there, but the band was on hiatus for a little while. Right. And many of the people in the band wound up kind of doing other things. And then Gary brought the band back together. And this year scheduling certainly was frustrating. I know for Gary, because it was, you know, trying to fit in the, into the holes that existed in everyone's schedule. And there were a lot of gigs he had to turn down. And, he just sent out a thing about two gigs next year, one in June and one in August. And after about 36 hours, he's like, forget it. I canceled them both because there were several people in the band that were like, well, look, I already have this. I already have that. And he's like, you know, he, he said something about, I thought 2024 was going to be different. Uh, I'm not convinced it is. And it's like, yeah, I can, I can yeah, see. But let me ask interest. you a question. Yeah. The guys who were available, do does bitterness start to build up there? Like, Hey, I could take the gig. I need the money. Does it, does it go for the guys who are available? Does it, is any resentment start to bubble? Oddly, I was one of the guys who was available for both of those dates. It, you know, it just happened to be that the holes were in my calendar and no, not at all. It's like, Uh, okay. I mean, because if it, if it were a band that were playing every weekend and had been playing every weekend and then this came up, be like, okay, well, wait a minute. But you know, we all have other things going on. Well, all of us other than Gary. And yeah. so I, 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 I'm curious to see at what, where is the tipping point of his frustration? Cause he's the one that does the work. He, he does all the bookings. Yeah. And at some point, I, like, like we all would, we, you know, there's that line. And when you hit it, yeah. it's like, forget it. I'm going to throw in the towel. Well, I, let's pause right there. Cause I have yeah. a ton of questions about that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I get, I get what Gary's feeling. So of what course, I'm hearing me you too. say, yeah, yeah. What I'm hearing you say is that Gary's note was dripping with a little sarcasm that was left purposely for interpretation. Like, are you guys going to make this worth my while? I don't think there was, there was, uh, I don't think it was left to be open to interpretation. I think (laughs) it was quite clear. (laughs) It was, it was nicely articulated. Um, The next one might not be quite as nice, right? You know, Um, but but it was was pretty clear. Yeah. So let, let's let's spin this around a couple of times, right? So to me and to you, so Uptown is a band that has a motivated booking guy. Very. Generally gets money gigs that are worth your time, right? And these were and these so, were very extremely well paying gigs. I think they were one was three grand, the other was five grand or something. So boom. yeah, yeah. All right. right. Yeah, I, I don't know. So, I don't know where everybody else is on that, but to me, that's good money for a band, you know. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying is, and again, think about the house rockers. So the house rockers are like, well, you know, pretty established group, you know, it gets paid, gets good gigs, all these types of things. I cannot, I'm in the same shoes as Gary. I, I have a hard time with the optic of what is first call, you know, availability, you know, what is, and I guess, well, or even more. This thing that is blown up into a pretty good thing, why would anybody want to mess with it is, is what I kind of come with. But they clearly, the mentality is it's, it's not a question of that. It's a question of time. I can, I, can, I can rent my time to the house rockers for X amount. I can rent my time to my own gig for Y amount. I can rent my gig to anybody else for Z amount. Yep. And this is the equation if you're, if you're a working musician, which is, which again, that is like a dagger in my heart because a band is a special thing. It's a unique thing. 
I, I don't disagree I, with you. You and I, you, <laughs> there, there, there are many things we've found over the years where we don't necessarily land in the same direction. Uh, the band concept is, is one of them where we definitely do land in the same direction. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I, the, the, yeah, the, the, the first, what you're hearing is me, you're hearing, you're just kind of hearing me emoting things. Like I, I've, I've kind of spun around this type of thing. You know, like, oh, I got to remember these, these are my friends and, and we've done a lot of, you know, over anywhere from two years of relationship to, to 25 years of relationship, you know, we've done this thing together. Uh, you know, can you not see that, that, you know, this is going to go on, right? Right. Yeah. There's and, a, there's a it, 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 history would indicate that this is going to remain a, a going concern. Yeah. Yeah. People yeah. like it. People are willing to pay for it. You yeah. know, I mean, it gets rebooked. It gets new bookings. I mean, there's all sorts of like, this is a very real thing. The degree to which the best that this thing is, is when it's 10 guys on the same page. It, it's, it's different. Like we're going to, we're going to have to incorporate a new drummer and, and, and learn our show. That's going to take a little bit of time. You know, that's, you know, that's just something we're going to, we're going to have to deal with. So, and then, but then also there's, there's demands on people's time. And Nick has been great. He's been like, dude, remember you're the one who moved away and I really have to check myself. And, and remember I, I created part of this change. I yes. somewhat na- yeah. naively have said, haven't you seen me making this three hour drive, you know, for weekends? Haven't you seen the weekends that I have reserved that I've kept my promise and filled those weekends with gigs. I mean, can't you see this is a real thing and it does take care and feeding from everybody to do that. And I, I think, I don't know, it could just be my own insecurities, but just kind of feels like it's not the same care and feeding. And I'm, and I read into that, like, you know, should I just say, let's, let's just, it, it was a good brotherhood, had a good run in that. Let's just change the business model, yep. you know, and you know, not worry about it anymore. And I, I don't know why it's so hard for me to swallow that pill I think I just have too much, um, I just mourn, I just mourn for when it was 10 guys on the same page, really kind of like everybody pushing for the same thing. That's a, that's a powerful drug to give up. You know, some pills are more bitter than others, my friend. Uh, well, (laughs) you marketing genius, you, um, so the, 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 you, you mentioned first call and, and obviously every band runs a little differently and, and you were lamenting, commenting that you know, you don't feel like first call necessarily means the same thing as it it used to. And, and these, that definition evolves too with, as you mentioned that I started thinking, you know, the uptown issue is a calendaring issue because guys had things booked. We have a Google calendar that Gary maintains that everyone has access to both read and, and write to. And the idea is, when you've booked something else, be it a gig, a vacation, a work trip, whatever, if you are unavailable on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, put it in the calendar. And that yep. way he knows when he's going to do bookings that it's all, you know, he knows w- w- what he's got at, at any m- point in time. And he thought he had everybody for these two. He, in fact, he, he, he presumed he had everybody for these two because there it was in the calendar. And then it was, oh, well, I haven't been keeping the calendar up to date. Oh, yeah, there was a thing that came in just a few days ago. I haven't updated the calendar. And I get that because I I update that calendar once every two weeks. I, I can't, like, drive myself crazy and, and keep it up to date all the time. I just happen to get, you know, get lucky on this one, I suppose, right? You know, I, I, yeah. I didn't have something that came in, but it's certainly possible with that kind of set up that there's going to be a lag and and there will be those those issues and so part of at least what we're dealing with in uptown could be you know instead of gary looking at the calendar and trusting it look at the calendar and throw the dates out to the band via text message and just say hey i'm looking at these they look open if they're not let me know asap right you know that kind of thing i and that's a that's a frustrating thing to have to manage but as as you know, six band members or five band members and a sound engineer uh, managing yet another Google Calendar and keeping your 
you know, all of that also a frustrating thing to manage. And I've tried to get that band on uh, that thing that uh, that one of our listeners made called Where's the Gig at Where's the Gig dot com. Yeah. I, I would love it if every one of my bands was on Where's the Gig. It is absolutely fantastic. And it, it if you've never checked it out, please go check it out. It'll manage not just everybody's availability, but you can manage set lists in there. You can put all the details for the gig. You can put booking contacts. You, like it, it's it's built to do. Guess what? Exactly what we all need it to do, right? Because it's built by someone who's doing it. So, but you know, it's one of those. It's technological friction, right? You know, where it's like, oh, I don't want to have another thing to manage, and it's like, well, if you <laughs> if you gave it a shot you might decide that it's way better than this current super frustrating uh, plan that we currently have, but it's, you know, it's hard to, I, I will, I can only suggest it so many times before it starts to sound annoying, you know? <laughs> so, yep. yeah. But it, what do you use to, do, I assume you use something like that too, right? What do you use to sync the, or manage your availability calendar, I guess is, well, remember, so I push the availability. I say these are the weekends that we're booking, right? Okay, so, right. So that's we right. start with that premise. So everybody marks their own calendars. Yep. We have a Google calendar. That's what we use in Slack. You know, so those are the two things. So yeah. So that's the way, you know, Slack for communication, you know, one-to-one or one-to-many, but Google calendar would be the, the, the general the general way we do it. On Slack, I'll post gig t- details. I'll post set lists. And, you know, the system seems to have worked and... And, uh, you know, yeah. I, I rarely, I rarely, if I can never think of someone who didn't have a gig on their calendar, some guys had some, like many people do Google calendar syncing issues and, sure. you know, you know, we found some work around if we needed to, but in general, it's worked pretty fine. I mean, yeah, it, it, we don't have a technology issue in communicating that's, with the 11 guys in our group. That's amazing. It, it I, I wish Uptown tried to use slack and there was some technological resistance um uh, amongst some of the members and and it fell apart so it is i think the thing about slack is that every once in a while when it updates it seems to forget its notification yes um, and so all of a sudden people aren't getting notifications or something needs to be responded to or something like that but i i will will say that slack for a band we use it for bitter pill and for fling and obviously you use it for the house rockers It, it is a fantastic way yeah, to keep things really organized. Good. And what I, what I will say, having been through it in a variety of different ways with bands and businesses, pick one Avenue of communication that the band is going to use. It don't have, well, is it in email? Is it in Slack? Is right. it a text message? Right. Pick one because yeah. you know, as much as I like Slack, I much prefer a text trail to a text trail, an email trail, and a Slack trail, right? Like it starts to get really confusing. Like I know, I know Gary told us this, where the heck is that information? You know, and, and so having it compartmentalized somewhere, even if it's an imperfect somewhere, and let's be honest, any of these solutions has its own sort of relative degree of imperfection and nothing is going to be exactly what you want, but. Uh, yep. Pick yep. pick yep. one, folks. If you're if you're doing it, yeah, yeah. Hey, we got a um, we got a question from listener Dan here, Paul, and I, I'm I'm really cu- I've run this by a lot of people, and uh, and I want to and I want to hear your thoughts, and obviously I'll share my thoughts and what I found. So Dan says, uh, "Hey guys, long time listener, first time caller, right? Sure. Uh, I'm booking my band <laughs> for dates next year." And one of the festivals we're booking sent me a contract that included a mutual cancellation clause. That is, they said if they cancel less than 90 days out, they owe us half. And if they cancel less than seven days out, they owe us the whole fee. I've seen that before, he says, though the 90 days is a bit longer than I'm used to. The next part, though, is where it gets interesting. They have the same clause in there for us, meaning if we cancel 90 days out, we owe them half. Seven days out, we owe them the whole thing. Have you guys ever heard of such a thing where a band has to pay a cancellation fee? I've never seen it before, and it seems very odd to me. Thanks for the show. Thanks for the note, Dan. Yeah. Have you seen this? Has anyone ever asked you to do this, Paul? Not not pay. I mean, sometimes it'll be that the band is responsible 
for finding their own replacement or something like that. But I've never, I mean, because yeah, usually like that's a, fair. a municipality or, a, or you, know, the, you know, whatever it is, your band fee is not going to make a, a whole lot of difference to them. Uh, so that's pretty, it's not uncommon to have a clause by which the band can cancel. Asking for money is a little weird. Yeah. Um, but again, you know. I, I've never heard of it before. And I asked everybody, the people who, you know, book the bands that I'm in, including Gary. And I figured of all the people that I know, you or he would be the ones who had seen it. Because, you know, it's like we're booking functions and, and those sorts of things that are, you know, maybe higher stakes if it's a corporate event. And at the last minute, you don't have a band or a wedding. I, I would ask the question, band, though. But, but no one's ever heard of it. So, yeah, go yeah, ahead. yeah, I would ask the question, is there something we're not being told? Like, is there a clause that allows for, for you know, force majeure or, you know, sickness or anything like that? Is it is it if you cancel for any reason? No, no, it, 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 I, I actually emailed back and forth with Dan. It, force majeure, act of God sort of thing is is excused for both parties. Right. It was. It, right. But yeah, yeah. So. So it's, but sickness started to get questionable based on the, the wording. And so it was like, yeah, okay. You know, but I mean, certainly coming out of COVID, there were COVID clauses yeah. that, that we put into our contract. That was our right to, you know, cancel without penalty Fail. in our, right. So, so when we issue a contract, there's no cancellation clause without restitution. Right. Uh, from and, the from the and, venue's end, but from your end, there's no restitution, right? That's it, right. It's baked in. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I'd never heard of it before. He he showed us, you know, the the bit of the contract, and it was like, yeah, really? okay, okay, I believe you. But yep, there's a first time for everything. <laughs> I will say this, you know, of all the municipalities that we deal with, you know, uh, uh, certainly in smaller towns, um, we've gotten a lot more. W- weird language and behavior from booking organizations. Like, okay. Like we were like one or two of our guys was late for a sound check at a, at a, um, at a, at a civic concert series. And these people came up and were actually in my face about this. I mean, like, where's your people? You signed a contract. And like, I didn't have an answer where they were, you know, when they were 10 minutes late. And I've also never been approached about that. So they were clearly like, we want the sound check done and want the band away. So when everybody gets here, there's nobody on stage, but the amount of aggression was, took me by surprise a little bit. And, you know, I put my leader hat on and just kind of dealt with it. But, but I, I, I do think that, I mean, it'd be interesting to know what, what, the, who issued that contract, whether it was a big city or a little town or, you know, a, a uh, you know, a privately, funded festival where yeah. you know they'll be out they'll be out money if if there's a no show from a band or something like that. Fair question. But yeah, that that yeah. part I don't know. Yeah, yeah. 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 Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um oh go ahead. Do you have I, I have other things, but you know, I've always got things. It's, uh, well, always I was going to I was going to bring up the the another listener mail we got from that sub who shared that um that he feels it's reasonable for a sub to get an equal share you know, re- he was responding to my thoughts when we were talking to Chris last time about, you know, what, what do subs get paid? And, you know, Chris was saying he, he always pays an equal share to a sub. And I was like, I have, I have always paid an equal, but I'm thinking about this. You, you want me to read, you want me to read his email? Yeah. I was able to pull it, pull it, pull it up here. It was yeah, please. Uh, a- avid listener is the name of the, uh, the, the person the who convenient wrote this. name. Yes. Yeah. That's, I'm, it's a, odd that, uh, your parents would have given you that name, but, uh, it fits perfectly. <laughs> I thought I'd put my two cents in as a sub. I accept or decline a certain fee communicated to me before the gig. Personally, I fully expect that my portion is an equal cut of the gig, although I never ask the question. If, however, I find out at some point that my portion was less than others made, I still play, but I will never sub with them again. I understand Paul's point about the band putting in more work overall, but as far as the particular gig goes, I have woodshedded the full show. I've made charts. I've watched tons of video. I've listened to songs on repeat. I've practiced the songs on my instrument. I've made sure I'm out of work on time, etc. The person that makes the decision after coming to me in need to divide the rest of my portion amongst themselves is not someone I care to work with ever again. I can tell you that it has happened and I've never accepted a gig with them again. Musicians often wonder why their talents are not looked at the same way as, say, a plumber. If I'm ever in a situation where I need a plumber ASAP, 
Nine times out of 10, I'll pay not only their fee, but also an after hours desperation fee on top of it. Uh, it it's an interesting perspective, right? I, and I, well, it, it's a well articulated perspective, but sure I, I, and I, I was kind of back in my heels when I first read it, but then I was thinking like, why wouldn't you ask the question up front? Like, why, why would you take the gig and then assume there was some kind of nefarious thing going on oh, behind? That's fair. And then, yeah. and then saying, you know, I'll never play with those people again. Why wouldn't you just, you know, if you know, why wouldn't you either say what your rate is or ask the question, is this an equal share? And you know, if, if the leader says no, you know, our policy is this, you can politely say no. But why, why would it become such a kind of aggressive type of thing? Is what I, what I came back with after thinking about that for a while. I, I mean, it, yeah. Why it, not it, ask if if that's your yeah. criteria? Like we all have our criteria, and 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 I don't begrudge anyone. I mean, I'm I'm a super particular person. I'm 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 downright weird, Paul. And uh, but <laughs> but I will make that known. Like uh, you you know, I mean, clearly avid. Uh, I don't know if it's it's Mr. or Mrs. or uh, listener. Mr. Listener. Yeah, but uh, but <laughs> Mr. Listener here, yeah, uh, is is very capable of of articulating their thoughts and feelings. So uh, that would be my advice: is if if this is important to you, and if this isn't, but something else is, make that known. And and you can like as you did here, you're you're able to be very clear and and yet not aggressive at all and so be that way about this you know with the person or people you're going to work for my guess is it's going to work out way better i i yeah, really i would think the comment i don't have a set fee but i do insist on being paid an equal share that's not an unreasonable thing mm -hmm. and then as the leader you can make the choice like yeah you know i'll give you another 30 bucks 50 bucks or whatever it might be yeah or you know or more should it be that but but uh but to be, I will not work with those people ever again. That kind of set me back on on my heels, saying, you know, someone who puts up that that strong offense about something like this without having done the communication to begin with, that seems a bit seems a bit harsh to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I and I mean, I've certainly worked with subs who have had, and I've had subs uh, have, who have like said, I need X amount per gig, and uh -huh. it's like, okay. Well, I mean, you know, if we want to hire you. And you get to say yes or no to that. And you yeah. get to say yes or no. Of course you do. Yep. I really like his relating this to, you know, a, a plumber and especially, you know, a plumber or a tradesperson who you need in an emergency. It is a good way of, of thinking about it. Musical. Well, uh, I don't musical know. Musical plumbers. I mean, you, uh, it, you don't offer a plumber, you know, I'll pay you this. I mean, it's a little bit different. And it again, is. With Plumbers plumber, just tell you what they're going to charge and you take it. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. And then, you know, the metaphor that I think is still worth holding up to the light is you have a band, a band is rehearsed weekly, daily, you know, for months and months. And yes, I don't discount, you know, a good sub putting in the time to prepare. But is it the same amount? Of, is it, you know, is it is it for any particular gig? I mean, you know, again, a band may have built a brand. Um, you know, there, there's a whole lot of things that go into, to me, that consideration, but net, net, you know, I would just want to have a good, honest conversation about it first and we can both make our informed decisions and, you know, no, no hidden agendas, right? you know, no, no withholding any information. Yeah. Although, uh, although a, a leader presented with that could say, you know, I, I don't, you know, that's, I, I, I'm not able to offer you that, you know. I, like if a sub said, what's everybody else being paid? I don't know that a leader owes that. Um, I don't know. Um, yeah. You, I mean, you, well, you can just say, you know what? This isn't going to work out. Yeah. And and that's, that's all right. Now, I, like <laughs> now, if you find, if you're, if you are told, yes, you'll get an equal share. And then you find out afterwards, that's a bad situation and you it know, totally. run, run it, run at top speed from that type of thing. But, but, yeah, I don't know. I, I it, when I first got it, I was like, oh, you know, he, a sub does put in a lot of time. Is it as much time? I don't know. But then I was thinking mostly about the. Uh, it, like, it, I, I can don't tell ask you for it up front. As someone who has done his fair share of subbing, it, like it's a lot of energy to invest. It's way simpler for me to go play like a bitter pill gig or a fling gig or an uptown gig sure. than it is for me to go sub with somebody this weekend. Right. Like, well, we had that conversation about there are subs whose approach is I'll get you through the gig. Yeah. Right. Yep. Would we, would we then say that person is absolutely not worth an equal share versus the subs who will, 
you know, be a true substitute for your regular guy, you know, and come in and learn yep. your show and that type of thing. So, the, you know, there's another shade of gray to the conversation is like, yeah, if someone says, I will, I'll sub for you, give me your show, I will learn it and walk in and be, you know, that, that'd be hard for me to say, nope, you're not worth it. Yeah, <laughs> you're yeah, not worth yeah. You will share. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But also it's a little, you know, I'll believe it when I see it sometimes. Right. <laughs> well, that's the thing is. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, but some pe- sometimes you get to see it and it's like, whoa, holy crap. Like this guy really yeah. showed up and did it. Like, you know, when we had, I was shocked when we had that last minute bass player sub for an uptown gig this summer. I mean, we literally found out on a maybe Thursday night, but I, it felt more like Friday morning for a Saturday afternoon gig that our bass player was sick and could not do the gig. And, you know, within an hour, our singer's like, my brother's available. He's a bass player. He's going to do the gig. And it was like, well, oh, okay. Like, I, I believe you when you say he will be there, but how in the world is he going to do this gig? You know, yeah. but she's like, nope, he, he's he got it. And it was like, okay. I mean, you know, it's like at some point you just got to trust somebody. And, and we did. And it was like, right. Yeah. He, well, I would guess most it. scenes are, are this way. Like there's. There's plenty, like we've had many conversations of what's a pro. So in yep. any scene, there's pro, there are a lot of people who say, I'm a pro level drummer, I can sub for you. And their full intention and communication that is that they will get you through a gig. They will keep they will keep time and largely start and stop when when you start. Well, yeah, when you when you cue them too. That's right. Yeah. And that that is one type. But yeah, as I yeah, shared, yeah. when we had Mike Vanderhuel, who is the most pro guy we've ever had, most pro, you know, he's with yeah. a big, big time touring band. Mm-hmm. Um, he learned our show. Russ is interesting. So Russ is, you know, he was a regular guy for many years. Right. He actually is like, well, I will sub if we can be sure that it's going to be a good show. So here's the material of yours that I know. And if we can, I, you know, I don't have time to learn additional material. But I'll sub for you if the show can be the stuff that I know that I can play well and and ro- be rock salad for you, which is another shade of that, right? Like though, so, so you, you know, when you, going back to our first discussion, when developing a bullpen, so now I have one sub drummer who knows 80, 70 of our songs, right? Sure, yeah, yeah. I have one sub drummer who seems to have an appetite to like, don't tell me what you want, just give me enough time. And, you know, I'll dive in. I have another sub drummer. The drummer who has been with us has said he'd be happy to sub on occasion if needed, who knows our current show. We have a desire, especially next year with our 25th year, to get, you know, a a pretty refreshed show in there. So so I think what it'll end up is there'll be some gigs where we'll be, you know, luckily, like with Russ, A, he's great. B, he knows a he lot knows, of your show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's right. it. Well, now he he knows not only the show that we've played last year, but he knows, you know, he said anything that I played with you guys and he sent me the list, we can do. So there's probably 30 or 40 songs at least that yeah. I can go back into history and pull out when Russ is there. That's kind of cool. Yeah. Just yeah, in yeah. the interest of of offering something different every now and then. Yeah. So So, yeah, it, but again, to our first conversation now, I have this kind of multi-headed thing I got to manage depending on who's subbing is the show that I can, that I can put on stage, right? Yep. The, the set list I can write, which, you know, we will put out good quality shows. That's good. Is it the most artistically stimulating thing we've ever done? You know, we had new stuff we were hoping to get to, and we may have to put that on the shelf for a little while for, you know, then it, it then actually becomes, well, the drummer who will sub, who has a capacity or interest or desire to learn new stuff along with us, even if he's not going to rehearse with us, you know, how many, what percentage of our shows will that be? If it's a very small percentage, probably not worth the rhythm section's time to, you know, learn this new stuff that we're not getting a chance to play that often. Right. Yep. So it's just a multidimensional yeah. evolving yeah. landscape for me. Yeah. Yeah. You got it. You know, you have, you have your depth chart and you know what each person's slightly different abilities All are. All great players though. I yep. mean, so, you know, I'm in a way your, better position fantasy, than most people would be. It's your fantasy, it's your fantasy house rockers league. You got to decide it. which, uh, which person to put that's, in which position. <laughs> that is it. Yeah. That's, that's brilliant. Brilliant. Um, I went, uh, to an event at a, a little, it's like a brew pub, food truck pod 
uh, here the other night. And there was a duo playing. I, I did not go to see this duo. They were they, they were you know booked, but there was a, a gathering of of people I knew, and so I I went to see these people, and it was fascinating to me watching this duo. They were first of all they were fantastic, and I wish I could remember their name, but I I don't. So what was I, the instrumentation? I'm a, I'm a t- well, that's the thing. It was a uh, man and a woman, both sang all kinds of different music. She played mostly fiddle or mandolin. Um, He played mandolin, banjo and guitar. She sometimes played guitar and like they were capable of just switching instruments for any given song. But also there were moments where they switched in the middle of songs and they were having a blast Mm -hmm. and their harmonies together. If you told me these people were, siblings just based on the way their harmonies were, I would absolutely believe you. And, but what was really interesting is it was a fairly small room, maybe, maybe 20 by 30 kind of thing. And they kept their volume really low. This was a gathering of, of people that wanted to talk and they just took on the role of being wallpaper. And it was sort of frustrating for me because I was there to see some people that I hadn't seen in a while and talk with them. And it was like, crap, we're in this room where there's music playing. A, as a musician, I, I I know how much it means to them to have somebody pay attention to them. But also B, they're freaking amazing mm-hmm. and I want to pay attention to them. So I was, you know, my attention was de- definitely, definitely split, you know, uh, for the evening. But I was, what really impressed me in addition to all the things that I've already said was how good they were at just assuming the role of wallpaper. Like they, they, they kept their levels really low, but not too low. They weren't attempting to engage with a crowd that was clearly there for a different reason. You know, it was, it was a non, it was an imperfect marriage of, of, you know, groups of people, but it was what it was. And they just accepted it. And clearly we're not upset by it. They, you know, yeah. they were having a blast playing with each other. And if you wanted in, they were happy to, you know, acknowledge you, but they weren't, they weren't talking in between songs to the crowd or anything. They would just talk to each other and then start playing the next song. And it was really a kind of a master class in that, you know, wallpaper gig scenario. And I was, I was impressed by it because I, I mean, I, I would assume that in, in the, over the course of our, our careers, we've all been there. I certainly have been there where you show up and you're like, ah, I see. This is what I'm doing tonight. Got it. You know, sometimes you know that going in. I don't think these people knew this going in. They, they couldn't possibly have, I don't think. But, um, but they really embraced it and, and were very entertaining. And, and after a little while of kind of chit-chatting with these people that I hadn't seen in a while, I took three steps to the right. And, and just kind of, you know, enjoyed sipping my beer and listening to them and sort of ignoring the folks that I was there with, but that, that's just me. Yeah. It, but it was really interesting to see, you know, that, that wallpaper thing done so well, like perfect volume, perfect. I don't know. Everything. Yeah. It was was good. Pros. What's that? Pros. Pros. Definite pros. Speaking of pros, you, um, there's this guy. Uh, he's from New Jersey. He's been playing for a long, long time. Uh, he plays he, he plays in a band with this guy, Little Steven and Max Weinberg. Mm-hmm. You know who I'm talking about? What's his name? Uh, yeah, give, give me a little more. Give me a little more. Uh, he was he he was famous songs. He, well, he was born both in the USA and to run. I I believe was all right. I think it's coming into focus for me. I think okay. I, I feel you right now. Yeah. So um, that guy. Mr. Mr. Springfield? No, Mr. Springsteen yeah. played played at a club in Connecticut called Toad's Place. Uh, have you heard of Toad's Place? Does that I ring? have. Okay. I, I've actually played Toad's Place, but uh but I, I'm not on the list of of like super famous people that have played there. I, obviously uh, Bruce Springsteen's played there. Uh, the Rolling Stones famously did a gig before their Steel Wheels tour there. They, uh, REM played there, Jocko played there. I mean, everybody played there. I, I've seen a bunch of bands there and, and there were plenty of bands that played when I wasn't there. Um, uh, there is a documentary attempting to be created for this. And I think a lot of it has been filmed for Toad's Place. 
And there is a Kickstarter to get it across the finish line. It just launched recently. I I can I don't contribute to too many Kickstarters, but I did contribute to this one because I'd love to see this uh, come together. Toads is a club in New Haven, Connecticut, right right next to the Yale campus, um, and it's it's a it's just one of those clubs that you know wound up being a stop on the touring circuit for so many people over the years that it just wound up being home to, to a lot of memories. So uh, I will put a link in the show notes to that. If you, yeah. uh, if well, anybody's interested in, in uh, checking it out. So, yeah. So my contribution to conversation about club dates is this um, Campbell, California in the late seventies, early eighties had a little strip of, of the business district that had four or five great clubs. And in that time, I mean, if you were to think about the names of people that played these little 200 seat and below clubs, that was a thing back then. It's not, I don't think it's a thing anymore. I don't think, I think the, the economics of things are just impossible for, for bands coming up to, you know, do a hundred dates in 200 person venues right now. But like, this is, Ronnie Montrose, Bonnie Raitt, you know, yeah. Louis Lewis in the News, playing 200-seat theaters, right? To- Toads and- is a little bigger. Toads is about an 800-seater. Uh, okay, so kind of slim size? Yeah, Sli- it would be on the same circuit as Slim's in a, a club in San Francisco. Yep, that's exactly right. Yep. Got yep. it, got it, got it. Um, but so, Me- so my point was- played there, Billy Joel wow. played there. Like, wow, no, wow. I mean, when I say- it's rare to find a band that hasn't, that, that has made it, that didn't wind up making their way through Toads at some point. Obviously, the Ramones and you know Men at Work and Rick. Well, James this little area that. in Campbell, you know, was probably the circuit that included the Troubadour and you know clubs, you know, down in L.A. that are famous because that yeah. would be yeah, that and, would be and, that and then, same you know, San circuit. Francisco. That's right. Yep. Yeah. So and and I, I'm only going to reminisce for a second because we just played our last date of the year. The House Rockers did on Saturday afternoon. It was supposed to be an outdoor event. Um, was supposed to rain. The organizer was like super on it. And instead of canceling, called up a local club and said, Hey, we want to bring everybody over there. Wow. And so we did a three 30 to six o'clock show on a Saturday afternoon to an absolutely packed, packed room. And, uh, it was, our, it's our last gig until the middle of January scheduled and the band absolutely crushed it. And I am, I am mostly reminded how useful being good at playing clubs is for a band. I mean, I know there are bands that are kind of put together purpose built to be like wedding bands or function bands, but I just think like, like to be able to play a packed room manager. I mean, it's just such a, I mean, this is like the Beatles at the cavern. Like you learn to be a band by playing those kind of like it's true energy. You know, you learn how to harness the energy of a crowd. I mean, all these types of things. I just think it's just so incredibly valuable. And I was really, we haven't played many clubs, you know, since coming yeah, out yeah. of COVID. Yeah. And it was a it was a great experience. I mean, the band played fantastically. Don it was his last regular gig with us. Yeah. Um the tempos were amazing. The you know, the groove all night was just stunning and 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 we just we we just slayed. It was just one of those days, not nights, one of those days. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And uh I was just thinking, you know, it's been so long since we've been a club band and it's just such a great thing to be able to do. I mean, it's it's hard to do it week in and week out. I, you know, I don't. And, it is a grind. And I, yes, it is a grind. And I don't think I don't even know if any of our guys could do a a nine p.m. till one thirty or two in the morning gig. And I I don't think I could make it through for one of those types of things. <laughs> but but you know, the, and the, the clubs that we do still have have been more like eight to eleven type things, and then DJ comes in after that, which you know is not a bad model, if. If you think about the audience that wants to consume classic rock and classic funk and soul stuff, they don't really want to go out until one in the morning, no. right? So no, 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 I, no. That I eight I, to eleven is the right the right time slot. Yeah, yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. Yeah, Bitter Pill played a gig. We played a gig on Thursday night, and it was um, well, you know, there was a lot of shared crisis involved in this gig. Uh, the 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 playing of it went well, but it, you reminded me of 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 it when you said you know having a band that's flexible that knows how to go in and and just work in the in the room that you're in. This was a basement gig in a town south of Boston on a Thursday night, uh, which and our load in was at like six thirty p.m. I live 
an hour north of Boston. So this would have been, you know, a 90 minute drive uh, with no traffic trying to get through Boston at rush hour on a Thursday night meant that it was, we were lucky that it was a two and a half hour drive to the, uh, you know, from door to door to get to the gig. So we got there and we loaded in and, and as we were, even as we were driving, I think Billy got there. There were three of us in the car. It was John, uh, our guitar player and fury, our Mando and sax player. And, uh, had texted us and said, Hey, does Dave have his pitch slap, his cajon with him? And I was like, yeah, of course. And he's like, okay, this room's really small. I was like, yep. Mm -hmm. All right, cool. So we, we get there and I don't take anything out of my car yet. You know, I just kind of like, let's go in, let's take a look at this. And we we're playing with two other bands. So there was going to be change over time and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, we kind of looked at the room and, and it was like, they, and they had a, a drum set to use as a backline if we wanted, but, as soon as we saw it, I looked at Billy and I'm like, I'm, I'm really leaning towards just all pitch slap tonight. And he's like, okay, good. Me too. Like, great. We're in. And so that's what we did. And it was a different layout, different lineup. We actually were down one person that couldn't make the drive last minute, but having a band that knows how to, like you said, harness the energy of a given room and it comes from playing those club dates. This was obviously not a club date, but it was that same kind of thing. Like, all right, we're here. Here's these people. Here's the instrumentation that works for us to do at this very moment in time. And here's what we're going to do. And we just went out and we slayed it and it was just perfect. And then, nice. and then we had to drive home, you know, obviously. So the, the gig was great. The, 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 when I mentioned shared crisis, it was just the, you know, the drive back and forth was just a yeah. little much to do on a Thursday night. But, um, but it was that same kind of thing. It was like, thank goodness we all are pros and could come into this and with very little notice, just sort of reconfigure and be like, yep, this is how it's going to be. It's going to be totally fine. And, and just rock it. You know, it's, it wasn't like, well, we're going to have to deal with this scenario and m muddle through. It was like, nope, this is the lineup, and now we're going to go and crush it. And we did, and it was fantastic. It was a blast. We entertained. We entertained ourselves. We entertained the people that were there. It was great. So, you know, but that's rock and roll. That's rock and roll. But it it is, you know, all those those years that you spend on all different kinds of stages, it it does pay off. Uh, it's how you learn to be a band, I think. I mean, it's yeah. like a, it's, it's learning how you get the chemistry to get the mojo out of stuff. There's there's plenty of great players who form, you know, professional associations that are bands that, that will work and will get the job done in yeah. many places, and some and sometimes more than get the job done. But you know, d to reach deep into music and and translated into something bigger you need to be able to work those rooms get people sweating get people screaming you know it's just a, it's a great thing if you can do it i mean I, I i realized that i missed it quite a bit it didn't pay very well but yeah yeah right was, right yeah. no this this basement gig also same yeah but it was like okay like this we did it and we we absolutely did the best that could have been done in there and yeah. that and there's something you know there's pride in that uh, for sure for sure yeah man I don't think I have anything else. You got anything else for tonight, man? Well, just wishing you and your beautiful family a happy Thanksgiving. We've had a great year. I am super thankful to have had this live therapy, get these nice notes from people around the world who seem to like listening. Yeah. It's just been a really nice thing. So wishing you and everybody out there happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to you too, Paul, and happy Thanksgiving to, uh, to everybody who's listening. Thanks for hanging out with us. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. That is where you can uh, you can send in and you can be referred to as avid listener if you so choose. Whatever name you give us, that's the one we're going to use. Unless we pick a different one. Because, you know, podcaster's choice. Paul, in addition to just always making sure that you're out there and entertaining, what else must we do? Always be performing.